Hey guys, my name is Vishwas and in this video, we are going to go over 10 modern JavaScript topics you should be familiar with before starting out on React, Vue or Angular. Let me tell right away that you can always dive straight into the framework or libraries. But what I found is that it helps to know some of the modern JavaScript features as they are the prerequisites to most of the learning material that you find online. Also, if you've watched my modern JavaScript learning path, it might be daunting to see so many concepts listed. So this video is for you if you want to spend a few minutes and get familiar with JavaScript so that your journey of learning either React or Vue or Angular will be that much more simpler. Don't worry, we're going to keep this short and simple with slides and code snippets instead of live coding. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Kite. Kite is a completely free plugin that integrates into your text editor to provide AI-powered code completions. Because of machine learning, Kite's completions are sorted by relevance rather than being sorted alphabetically. Check out the link in the description down below to download Kite for free. All right. The first topic is let and const variable declarations. Gone are the days when variables were declared using the var keyword. Now you're going to see variables declared using the let and const keywords. Both keywords ensure that the variables declared are block scoped. The difference is that all const declarations must be initialized and once initialized, you cannot reassign a new value. So you could declare let name and name is equal to Vishwas on the next line, but with const, it has to be const name is equal to Vishwas on the same line. Also, we can reassign a new value to let declared variable, but not const. It is going to throw an error. A good rule of thumb is to always use const declarations unless the variable value is going to change, in which case you can make use of let. The second topic to learn is the shorthand object assignment. As a beginner, when you see this feature in use, it's going to confuse you. But it is so common now that you just have to know this. Let's say we had a constant name equal to Vishwas and channel equal to the string code evolution. If you had to create an object called YouTube with similar properties, you would specify the key as name value as name, key as channel, and value as channel. With the shorthand object assignment, we can now initialize objects in a more concise way. When the property name in your object is the same as your variable name, you can simply specify the key and the value is inferred to be the same as the key. Trust me, this is a feature you're going to see a lot in every code base. All right, let's move on to the third feature, which is destructuring assignment. It is a feature that makes it possible to extract values from objects or arrays with ease. Let's take a look at an example. In case of an object, consider an object called name with two properties, first and last. To extract these values, traditionally, we would say const first is equal to name.first and const last is equal to name.last. But with destructuring assignment, we can directly extract the properties into the corresponding constants, as you can see on line six. You could also alias the variable names with a colon, as you can see on line seven. So in your code, name.first would now be accessed using F and name.last would now be accessed using L. Array destructuring also behaves in a similar fashion. Consider an array name where we have Bruce and Wayne at index position zero and one. To extract these values, we would typically write const first is equal to name of zero and const last is equal to name of one. With destructuring, you can simplify this in the way you see on line two. Const first comma last within an array 
and then name on the right hand side. Restructuring assignment is heavily used in React when it comes to extracting the necessary props or state from a whole bunch of values. You'll also see this when extracting return value from functions, from custom hooks, and also from API calls, be it Vue or Angular or React. So definitely a feature that you need to be aware of. The fourth feature to discuss is the spread syntax. It is represented by three dots and usually works on a collection of values or an iterable to be more precise. You're going to see its usage mainly with arrays and objects. And the first use case is to make a copy of an array or object. On line one, we have an array. To create a copy of that array, we use three dots within square brackets. So array copy is also going to be an array with one, two, and three as elements. Similarly, if we have an object obj with two properties, within curly braces, we can use the spread operator and then obj. Object copy is now going to be an object with first and last as the two properties. This comes in really handy when working with state in any of the libraries, be it local component state or state in Redux, Vuex, and so on. You need to make copies of the state before mutating it. Spread syntax is frequently used for that purpose. Another possible usage you are going to come across quite often is either concatenating arrays or merging objects. As you can see, with the spread syntax, both are one-liners. The fifth feature is optional chaining. The optional chaining operator, represented by question mark and a dot, provides a safe way to access nested properties, even if an intermediate property doesn't exist. Let's take a look at an example to make this more clear. Consider an object called person with two properties, name and details. The details property is another object with two more properties, age and address. Address is again an object with a property called city. Let's say we have to access the city property on this person object. Then you would have to make all the necessary checks to ensure that your code doesn't throw an error and break your UI. You can see that we first check if the details property exists and then the address property exists and then the city property is rendered. If you were to directly specify what you see here on line 14, but your object doesn't contain the property called address for some reason, JavaScript will throw an error cannot read property city of undefined. I'm sure you might have seen that error quite a few times. Optional chaining provides a safer and concise way to access the city property. You can see that before we access the property, we add the optional chaining operator and that ensures our code doesn't throw an error if the value is null or undefined. The optional chaining operator also works with arrays. On the right hand side, you can see that we have person.hobbies, which is an array. When working with arrays, and if you want to access, let's say the first item in the array, we had to make a check that the length of the array is not zero. To access the name property on the first hobby, you can see the amount of code we have to write. With optional chaining, this is simplified as well. Optional chaining is not something specific to a library. It's one that you're going to find in almost all the modern code bases when trying to access deeply nested properties in objects or arrays. So the next time you come across the question mark dot operator, you should know what it is. Let's now move on to the sixth feature, which is the nullish coalescing operator represented by double question mark. This operator helps you fall back to a default value if a value is null or undefined. 
Earlier, when you'd want to assign a default value to a variable, a common pattern was to use the logical OR operator. So here in our first example, we have name equals Vishwas and in the next line, username is going to be equal to name and if the name isn't provided, username fallbacks to a default value of guest. So on line three, we would see the output as Vishwas since name has a value. But the same example, when name is not provided or equal to null, username would log guest to the console. This was okay, but there was one problem. Since the logical OR operator forces the left-hand operand to a Boolean value, it would consider any falsy value. This obviously would become a problem with an empty string value or the number zero. In this example, you can see that username logs guest instead of empty string and count logs not available or not applicable instead of zero. The nullish coalescing operator avoids this pitfall by only returning the second operand when the first one evaluates to either null or undefined. So when there is a need to assign a fallback value, you're going to see the usage of nullish coalescing operator. Now, this is one of the more recent features, so you're going to start seeing more of this operator as time progresses. All right, let's now move on to feature number seven, which is the ternary operator. This is an operator that has been in JavaScript for a long time now, but it is one that you should know, especially if you're working with React, as it is an operator commonly used for conditional rendering. Syntax of the operator is as follows. Condition, question mark, expression to execute if condition is true, colon, condition to execute if expression is false. So if we have a constant logged in equal to true, we could have another constant name equal to the ternary operator where the condition is logged in is true or not. If logged in is true, we assign the string Vishwas to name, else we assign the string guest to name. So the operator behaves like an if else statement. In React, you cannot use if else statements within JSX. So ternary operator will help you with conditional rendering. You can see the same JavaScript code translated into a React component on the right hand side. The next topic is template literals, which was introduced in ES6. Prior to ES6, when we had to concatenate values into a string, we would use the plus operator. Personally, I wasn't a fan of that. You can see in the example here that we have three constants, greeting, name, and sport. To ask the question, hello Vishwas, do you like football? We had to go into so much trouble to concatenate strings and also remember to add a space where required. With template literals, we can now use what is known as string interpolation. So you start off by using backticks instead of a single or double quotes. Backticks is the key just below your escape key. And then to replace a variable or constant value inside the string, we use the dollar sign followed by curly braces and within the curly braces, we specify the variable name. As you can see, this is so much simpler. Template literals is another feature that you're going to see pretty much in any modern JavaScript code, be it React, Vue, Angular, or even Node. Next up, we have arrow functions. Arrow functions are often used for keeping the code concise. So let's take a few examples to compare a traditional function with an arrow function. Let's start off with the basic syntax. For a traditional function, we have the function keyword followed by the function name, followed by parentheses for the function parameters, and then curly braces for the function body. With arrow functions, you start with the const keyword followed by the function name. We then have 
the actual arrow function assigned to the constant. The arrow function starts off with parentheses for the function parameters, followed by the fat arrow syntax, and then curly braces for the function body. Let's see two cases where the arrow function syntax might seem confusing at first glance. The first case is when the function accepts a single parameter. We have the traditional function which accepts name and logs the same to the console. Now, on the right hand side, you can see the same with arrow functions. The noticeable difference is that the name parameter doesn't need to be contained within parentheses. And this is valid only when the function accepts a single parameter. No more, no less. So the next time you see this syntax, recall that it's just a parameter. The second case is the case of implicit return. On the left hand side, we have a traditional function called getName, which returns the string Vishwas. The same function can be shortened to a good extent with arrow functions, which you can now see on the right hand side. When you have just the one line of code in your function, which is also the return value of that function, you can specify an inline arrow function, which implicitly returns the value on the right hand side of the arrow syntax. You're going to see the syntax used a lot when assigning event handlers in any of the three libraries. So make sure to keep this in mind. All right, the 10th and final topic is about import and export statements. Anytime you're working on a modern JavaScript project, chances are that your code is split into several modules or files which perform specific functionality. This promotes code reuse and code organization. This is also the case with React, Vue, or Angular, which follow a component-based architecture. So it is essential to understand how to export functionality from one file and import the same in a different file to make use of it. Let's understand the common export and import syntaxes with examples. Let's start with named exports. Consider a file called file1.js. Within the file, we have two constants called first name and last name that we want to reuse in a different file. To export the two constants, we use the export keyword and then within curly braces, we specify first name and last name. If you want to, you could also add the export statement in line with the constant declaration. To export const first name, export const last name. All right, now that we understand how to export, let's understand how to import these two constants in another file called file2.js. We use the import keyword followed by curly braces with what we want to import followed by the from keyword followed by a path to the source file. In our case, let's assume both the files are in the same folder. In file two, you can now log the values of first name and last name, and you should see the expected output. It's also possible for you to import all exported variables from another file as one object. Here, you can see that we are importing star as person from file1.js. So import everything as person from file one. This allows us to log to the console person.firstname and person.lastname. Another point to keep in mind is that you may have multiple files that have the same named export. In such scenarios, you can make use of an alias for your import. So you can see that in the third code snippet, we import first name as username and we log username to the console. So that is about named exports. You're also going to come across default exports and imports. Let's take a look at that. Default export import can be used to export and import a single functionality. So from file one, 
we can export the constant using the default keyword. So export default name. This allows us to import the same in file2.js. The difference here is that we don't need curly braces like in the case of named exports. Also, default export allows you to import with any label you wish to. So you could import username from file1 and the output remains the same. With that, we come to the end of the 10 JavaScript features that will help you take your next step into the world of React, Vue, or Angular. In addition to the 10 topics, I would highly recommend you also go through some of the array methods and also about promises and async await. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video.